Hi, welcome to La Fabrique Studio in the south of France. My name is Sylvia Manassi, and I came here to the Mix with the Masters seminar to uh, show some people some unusual techniques for recording and mixing. We've had a great week. Uh, we did a bunch of uh, really interesting things, including um, running a guitar through a drill. Uh, let's see, we had a singer stand on a speaker and sing to a tool. Uh, we built a special microphone out of a phone. What else did we do? We built a potato filter for your guitar. All these things that you really need to know about. Well, uh, anyway, Sound on Sound has uh, sent us over some questions. So I'll do a question and answer now with the readers of Sound on Sound. And I have some prepared questions. So let's go through it. Jonathan Leith. Hey, Sylvia, when using a 1073 EQ, I always seem to experiment with the frequency selections and move things around until it sounds good. It's rare that I make corrective cuts with it though. Are there any go-to frequencies that you find yourself routinely cutting, perhaps on problematic instruments like room mics or bass? What are your other favorite EQs alone or in combination with a 1073? And what sources do you use them on? Thanks so much. Jonathan. 1073, you're already in a, in, in a great position. Um, the 1073 doesn't give you a lot of choices, so you can't really screw it up too badly. I tend to add more than I cut, but when I do cut, I'll cut some mid frequencies, some lower mids to kind of uh, clear up a sound. For instance, I might use, um, uh, I might cut around 350 in the mids. Uh, to to give some clarity to toms uh, and maybe pull a little bit of that out on a kick drum. I use the high pass filters quite a bit, especially on high frequency instruments like the hi hats on drums or on uh, overheads. Uh, the 1073 EQ is a fantastic EQ and your anything you put through it already, even if the EQ is not even turned on, it's gonna sound better than you started. Makes you look like a genius. I've been using it for years. That says a lot. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Timmy Fasano, hi Sylvia. For us out there with a Pro Tools rig and limited microphone selections, would you recommend we play it safe in the engineering of our recordings? For example, not try to build much of a sound into the recording due to lack of equipment. This way it's a blank canvas for the mixing. Thanks. Timmy, I would say never save anything for mixing. Even if you have inexpensive mics, that should not affect the, the way that you record. Um, I record with inexpensive mics all the time. It's, uh, in fact, that's, those are my go-tos before I reach for an expensive mic. Um, so you'll see me using SM57s, SM58s, uh, Sennheiser 421s, um, uh, SM81 Shure microphones for the high end or even for overheads. Uh, we're, we're never shy in using inexpensive mics for many reasons. Uh, for one thing, you can make big mistakes with them, and if they break or get destroyed, then you don't have to worry about it too much. So you can really experiment with them. And, and for that reason, also experiment all the time. Spend more time uh, working on the sounds that you're recording than you would in, in your mixing. Um, basically, I try to record in a way where when I push up the faders on the desk, and I do use a desk, I do use a console, it's already mixed. You can do the same thing in the box. Uh, you can record in a way where it's already mixed uh, when you're finished recording, when you put your last overdubs in and you finish your vocals and you've done your little edits and tuning or whatever you want to do, uh, your mix should be close to being finished. So, and, and another, another thing is, uh, Vocals, sometimes you think you need an expensive mic, but honest to goodness, you don't need an expensive mic for vocals. A lot of times I'll use an SM58 for vocals. Um, even if I have a Telefunken can 47 in the studio, uh, one time when I worked with Rick Rubin, we set up, oh, $20,000 worth of vintage microphones in the studio at Ocean Way. And 
We put them all in a row, and then we put up a Sennheiser 421 and a Shure SM57 and a Shure SM58, and we thought, well, we'll listen to those two just, just to have perspective. Well, we had uh, these fantastic vintage German mics, a Telefunken 251, uh, U47s, U67s, we had Neumann U87s, and we had Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins sing a verse, the same verse in each mic on a different track. And then we, without knowing what those mics were on the playback, we compared each one. And the one, the mic that won was the SM58. And that's a $100 microphone. So uh, you could have in your mic closet, you could have only SM58s, and I think you're still doing very well. So thank you, Timmy. Let's move on to the next question. Gibran Ramirez, thank you for writing. He writes, how many hours do you think is necessary for a good recording session? What is the most important thing in the studio to you? A day, you don't want less than a day. <laughs> uh, I, I think to get momentum in a recording session, you need a full day. And that means eight to 10 hours just to get moving. I often, when I set up uh, my scheduling or, or budgets for a project, I estimate needing three days per song to do the recording, the editing, any processing, and mixing for each song. And that would include some time to spend on working on s arrangements with the band or anything. Uh, so three days per song I think is good. So three 10 hour days, you're looking at 30 hours minimum. That is a, a luxury, I suppose, for some people. So just go into it, uh, spend the most time on the first song, leave everything set up, record as many songs as you can with that initial setup, and then you can then you speed up your uh, production at that point if you continue to record uh, overdubs using your initial tracking from the first day or first two days. There's ways to schedule things to uh, work that way. Terry Lee Bolton asks a question, how do you get your best sound on recorded drums? Terry, I love recording drums. It's my specialty and I do it with very simple drum miking techniques. The, the trick for me that makes uh, the best sound on drums is to have all the microphones pointed in the same direction. It's a very simple technique and if uh, you, no matter what types of mics you're using, if you generally have them all facing the same way, uh, pointing in the same direction, instead of pointing at each other, the, you're going to get a much better sound and it's instantly will have more low end, more punch, uh, sound bigger and better. Uh, if you hear a papery sound on your snare, when, you're, when you turn all your mics on, all of a sudden your snare sounds thin, then there's a problem with your phasing and you should look at how the mics are pointed. I oftentimes, when I bring up, uh, I, may, I may be recording 10 to 20 mics on a drum kit and I'll very carefully compare my kick drum mic with my overhead mics soloed uh, in mono and just to check and flip the phase on those microphones. Sometimes it's difficult to flip phase when you're recording with a rack of mic pre's. So in that case, I would prepare some uh, mic cables with reverse phase so that you can make some comparisons like this and you'll get the best sounds this way. Uh, another thing to do is to sum, if you have a way to sum mics while you're recording, your drums will sound better. For instance, if you have f three toms and you record a mic on the top of your tom and a mic on the bottom of your tom, let's say one, one tom, one mic on top, one mic on, top, on bottom, and you have three toms, combine all those mics, which would be six mics, into two tracks. You use uh, busing. If you have a console, you can use the busing on the console. There's other ways to sum mics together, but you'll need to, to have a piece of gear that will allow you to sum several mics into two channels. 
uh, that's just going to make your drum sound better. Be careful to reverse the phase on these mics that are pointing at each other, one on top, one on bottom. Uh, so this is, I think this is the secret to recording great drum sounds. Usually I don't record with, uh, well, I record with very little EQ on uh, the drums and, uh, and they turn out great just with this very careful technique of having all the mics moving in one direction. All right, next question. Edward LeBron, your favorite mic preamps and what is your most memorable recording session? I'm a bit of a snob about mic preamps. In fact, I think if you're recording that this, is, this may be the most important thing that you'll want to spend money on is your mic preamp, more so than the microphones, more so than anything else. Uh, the mic preamplifiers preampli will color and and uh, change the, sa the, change the um, shape of your sound. If you have really inexpensive mic preamps, it is very difficult to achieve the sound that you want. So I use the Neve 1073, which is also a, called a 1272 mic preamplifier. Um, it's the little red knob on the 1073. That's the magic knob. Uh, so I would highly recommend uh, 1073 or 1272 Neve mic preamplifier. The APIs are also very good. Uh, I've been using mic preamplifiers from Black Lion Audio, and uh, I think that they're also very good. Uh, there's uh, several boutique um, makers that are good, but I always lean towards the Neve 1073 because I really know what I'm going to get. And he also asked, Edward, he asked, which is your most memorable recording session? Well, that would have to be Johnny Cash with uh, Rick Rubin producing and I was engineering. Uh, the album was called Unhinged and it was magic. Every day was magic in Los Angeles while we recorded it because I would turn my head and look in the back of the room while I was working at a console. And in the back of the room, there would be someone else, so, some some other big star in the room that I wouldn't be expecting. I'd turn around and there would be Anthony Kiedis or there would be um, Mick Fleetwood or Lindsey Buckingham or Marty Stewart or Carl Perkins uh, and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers was the backup band for the album. So you can only ex imagine what uh, that was like. Uh, it was pure magic every day, and uh, that has been, so far, my favorite recording session. Okay, next question. Chin Jayan, any tips for recording violin sections? I have a special technique for re recording strings, and it's, uh, and it's basically because I tried recording quartets, tried writing uh, uh, music for quartets, and conducting quartets uh, or string sections, what I've found the easiest and best way to do string parts on, uh, on my recordings has been to use one player and to have that player play uh, as many parts. I, I have a multi-instrumentalist that I use quite often. His name is Morgan O'Shaughnessy. And he plays viola, is his main instrument, but he also plays violin, he plays cello, he plays nickel harpa, which is a very unusual Swedish instrument, uh, and, and several other instruments, bagpipes and uh, illin pipes. And so we start on a project, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring him in to the uh, recording. The song will already be relatively finished, but there will be a section where I, I hear a melody and I want to develop a, a string arrangement for um, this particular section of a song. So we start with the melody first and I'll have him do uh, the first viola parts. Then we'll do a second viola part and each, each part is recorded uh, twice mono. And then I'll split each part uh, left and right, hard left and right, so then the second viola part, and then we'll put in a, a violin, first viola, violin part and a second violin part, 
we'll uh, put cellos under there, usually just one cello part. Again, recording each part uh, twice so that we have stereo and, and making it wide. Uh, then we might add some other uh, violin melodies across the top. And it's really full and, uh, and exciting. We can get into details too. If one part is not working so well, we can remove that and, and change it. If you're working with a string section, like a section with you know, uh, four to 20 players, it's very, very difficult to change things once they've been recorded. But working one track at a time with one string player is very good, economical, and uh, with great results. So that's my technique. Everyone has a, a different technique. And let's see, we have another question. Estuardo Salazar. Hi, Sylvia. Is there any guideline on how to direct an artist without compromising their sound with your musical influences? Well, this is a very interesting question because uh, I try not to get in the way of the music, uh, the, the band and their sound. However, I'm being hired to, uh, because of something that I do. And if, it's, if what I do is to create a certain sound, uh, I want to also bring that to any client that hires me. So I'll, I'll go as far with that as I'm allowed. But again, it's very important for the, um, the artist to maintain their uh, identity. Uh, I like to help guide that and to really define an artist's sound. So we'll do that by looking at the equipment that they're using, uh, the instruments that they're playing, and, uh, and if, it's, if there's a certain instrument that is part of their signature, then I want to use a thread of that through a, an entire project. So not only one song, but maybe f five of eight songs will have this special sound so that a, the a project has continuity like that. So I'll try to help an artist to develop their sound so it's, it, it, it is their sound and they leave the session with that being their sound also. And that's a very interesting question. Thank you, Eduardo. Okay, Russell Bell. How do you shift between so many contrasting genres and what centers you when you undertake that? Well, at the core of, uh, of any genre, there's going to be really good music with good songs and good perf performers. So. It doesn't matter what style of music I'm working on. I, I, I'm a fan of the music in a, in a way where I can appreciate if it's jazz, if it's bluegrass, if it's uh, Scandinavian metal, which I love, um, uh, if it's country or roots country, which I also love, um, if it's uh, R&B, you know, there's, there's obviously there's great music in all those genres. And it, it all boils down to the song, and I think also the character of the, the person who's singing, uh, or who has the voice in the band. The, the voice may not be a human voice at all. It may be the, the voice of a guitarist or uh, another instrumentalist. So you just have to identify what that is and really feel the emotion and, and really understand the story uh, of what they're trying to tell you with their music. So that's what centers me. Michael Griggs. Hi, Sylvia. What are the things you feel like you have had to compromise over your career during a project and how have you overcome them? The first thing I think of is uh, compromise. Well, having a, a regular life is a compromise. <laughs> You spend a lot of time in the studio. You pretty much put the rest of your life aside. Uh, this is my life. Uh, it's also very difficult to be a girl in the studio. I have found, like, just like dressing up and you know taking time to be a girl and do girl things. You know, it's very difficult. But I try uh, very hard to be a girl. I'm sure that's not what you're asking about, Michael. So uh, the things that I think really have uh, really compromised a recording would be a lack of time to really flush out an idea. So I try to build enough time into a project um, so that that doesn't happen. 
I very, I'm very careful to listen to some music from the artist beforehand to understand the instrumentation, to get an idea of how much time it will take to get a really good recording. If the budget doesn't allow enough time, I will probably pass on the project and only because I don't want disappointments. I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want my client to be disappointed either. So that is where uh, the greatest amount of compromise happens, I believe. Um, they, the other thing is uh, instruments and equipment can really compromise the quality of a project. However, less so because there's ways you can make really fun and creative recordings with very with with whatever you've got. You know, you can record with most anything these days, a laptop and a M box or whatever, and some a couple mics, one mic. There's a lot you can do with that. <laughs> so have fun. Just have enough time so that you can really think out your ideas. Uh, and I think that that might be all the questions we have today. Uh, we've had a great time at uh, La Fabrique, and I hope to come back again soon. Thank you.